Okay, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to see you here. So, number, so let, let me just, before we start, uh, thank the funders. Okay, This is part of a project called ARED, Agency Rationality and Epistemic Defeat, which involves philosophers, developmental psychologists, and people working on comparative cognition. And it's run by the Universities of Sterling and the University of Vienna. Okay? And uh, it's part of what we do to engage with the general public in issues having to do with the relation between human and animal, for example. Okay. So this is what the lecture of today is about. Well, perhaps it's about how important the way we treat animals is with respect to some of big, the big challenges we face today. Anyway, the lecture is delivered by Professor Mark Rowland, who is a world-leading scholar in the study of animal minds, morality, and human-animal relations. He has authored many books on these topics. Now, some of them are written for specialists, but others are a joy to read for everyone. Word on Fire is the last one, is one of those, okay? And that, that's what the, the, the lecture is about today. But probably the most famous is The Philosopher and the Wolf. Now, if you like animals, and if you think that we may have something to learn from animals, and you haven't read The Philosopher and the Wolf, I suggest you do it as soon as possible. It's great, okay? Now, enough of me. Let me just thank the funders. I didn't mention that. UK, you are right. They are the funders. Okay. At the end of the talk, there will be time for a little bit of a Q&A, but we'll have to be done by 7.30. Okay, Mark. <laughs> This microphone, I didn't even think to ask about a microphone. I, I probably won't need one, but can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. Um, I, I, I'd like to thank Ared under the auspices of Giacomo for, uh, for, for inviting me to speak. Also, uh, big thanks to the, uh, the Scots Philosophical Association who've allowed me to, um, to visit here not once but twice in the last few months. Um, um, during my last visit, uh, I was talking to my friend Mike Wheeler, he's, he's at the back here, and he said, You know, Mark. You're always terrible at starting talks. I, I thought about it. I thought, yeah, he's, he's probably he's probably not not wrong, you know. I I, I thought about why this was, and I, I I worked out it's because I I insist on trying to sort of ad lib at the beginning, and I just can't do it. Right at the end, maybe when I'm warmed up, it it sometimes comes off, but at the beginning, well. Um. So here I am. I, I just it seems I can't help myself. So I, what what I'll do is, is is stop this 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 nonsense right away and um, and jump into the, uh, the 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 talk itself. Um. So three three sort of I think I think it's fair to call them sort of uh, you know epoch defining um, crises not to put too fine a point on it. Um, the first is, is mass extinction. It's a species that are, are currently going extinct at a rate several hundred to several thousand times the normal background rate of extinction, the normal rate you could expect um, under less unusual circumstances. Um, newly infectious emerging, uh, newly emerging infectious diseases. Uh, I, I don't need to dwell, you know, to, 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 to explain that anymore. A few years ago, I, I would have had to, but we all know what I'm, I'm talking about here. And, and third, um, climate change. Um, what I'm what, what I'm going to explore in this talk are the sort of deep connections, because I think there are deep connections between all three, um, all all three of these crises, and uh, the connections are perhaps surprising. So extinction, as I say, species going extinct at a rate several hundred to several thousand times the, the normal background rate. Um, they've been they've been on the planet five what, what are commonly known as the big five extinctions, the the, the big five great extinctions. Um, there was the end Ordovician, uh, which killed off eighty five percent of species. Global cooling was the uh, the the reason for that. Um, late Devonian, 75 species, 75% of species lost 
again, global cooling, in both cases, there was an explosion in plant life, which drew down carbon dioxide from, from the atmosphere and caused um, significant uh, global cooling. Um, there's the end Permian, the particularly nasty extinction, which, which wiped out up to 96% of species. It was more like 90 on land, but 96 uh, in the sea. Global warming was the, um, the cause there, caused by a, a series of um, eruptions in, in, well, you can't call it where Siberia is because this was Pangaea time, you know, but more or less where you would think Siberia would be if Siberia existed in Pangaea. That's where um, the volcanic eruptions were. So, you know, 90 something percent species lost. There was the end Triassic. Um, Again, vol volcanic activity, probably 80% 80, 80 of species lost. And uh, the end Cretaceous, the one which which did for the uh, the dinosaurs. Um, we, we all, you know, a, a, a meteorite strike, um, massive asteroid strike, meteorite strike, um, almost certainly caused that one. Now, today we're nowhere near there. Okay, we're, no, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about these sorts of numbers. What we're talking about is what we might call a mass extinction rather than a great extinction, right? Where a mass extinction is defined not in, ter not in terms of the number of species lost, but the rate at which they're being lost. But that rate, as I say, is, is somewhere between, you know, several hundred and several thousand um, species uh, more than we would expect at any given time. Um, okay. Clear that there's something going on, even if we're not at the level of great extinctions. Yes, um, there's something going on. There was a, a fairly recent calculation of, of the um, the bio, what's called the biomass distribution on Earth. Right. So to, to get a bio, a biomass calculation, you you take the average weight, uh, the average mass of um, a typical member of a species, and you multiply it by the number of individuals in that species. Okay. Um, so Milo, Byron, and Phillips did this in 2019 and came up with these sorts of figures. Um, so if you look at mammalian biomass, right, the biomass of mammals, 90, 96% of that biomass is made up either of us, we come in at 36%, or animals that we, we, we farm to eat, which come in at 60%. So of all mammalian biomass, there's only 4% left over for things that, that are not us or we don't eat, okay? Which seems a bit strange. With birds, it's a similar figure because we, you know, we're obviously not aging. 70% of birds, 70% of the biomass of birds um, is uh, comprises birds that we farm to, to eat. So... Um, Think of the sort of the world at the end of the last ice age, as, as we were coming out of the last ice age for, uh, 14,000 years ago. Or so then the, uh, the world was a kind of um, barely imagined bestiary of just fantastic animals. This is the, the first one here is the short faced bear, which spanned from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, basically, and then worked its way into the Americas too. Uh, the comparison is with uh, the modern day black bear and the, the grizzly bear, significantly sort of larger. There were saber toothed cats, of course, there were dire wolves, mammoths, mastodons, um, giant grand sloths as, as, as big as an elephant. All, all these are gone. And um, it's very likely, it's disputed, but it's very likely the humans were largely responsible for this. So you, you could think of the human species, if you like, as a sort of gigantic biomass redistrib redistributor, right? We, 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 we take biomass and we, we move it from animals such as these um, to animals such as us or the ones we eat. That's what we seem to have, 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 have accomplished. Um, so... Whether or not we were responsible for the so-called quaternary distinction, um, there's, there's 
little doubt about what's going on today. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll hear people ask, are we, are we at the beginning of a sixth great extinction or mass extinction? Uh, whatever you want to call it. And I, I think um, I think the question is misleading because probably we're, we're already in it and we have been for 40,000 years or so. Because extinctions, I mean, we, we tend to think of them as events. Okay, well, this is when the extinction happens, but they're not. They're, 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 they're long-term processes. So the, the end Permian, for example, was a series of extinction pulses which spread out over 25 million years. Um. 14,000 years in the great scheme of things is not, um, is, is, is not a lot, long time. But whether, whether or not that, that's true, um, it's, it's pretty clear what the, the main drivers of extinction are today, in particular the main driver. Ipbez, whose name I always have to write down because I can never remember what it, what it, it's called the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform mm -hmm. on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services is a UN body. They publish a global assessment report every, every few years. Uh, the most recent one, 2020. Um, there they, they, they document they, they document the, the number one extinction driver, the number one driver of extinction, which is habitat loss. It's not climate change, which surprises some people. That's, that's number three. Um, it's habitat loss resulting from change in land use. Okay, And that change in land use can come from, uh, well, can, can be the result of a variety of things. But the number one reason for change in land use is agricultural expansion. And um, the number one form of agricultural expansion is, is pastoral. It's animal farming. Um, whether this is direct animal farming, where you have animals grazing on a certain area of land, or whether you're growing crops, typically soy, in order to feed animals, which are not grazing. Um, so it seems that the, the, the number one driver of mass extinction today is, is, um, is animal farming. Okay. Um, so animal agriculture seems to be the most sing single significant factor driving extinction. So pandemic, as I say, this, this, this character needs no, um, no introduction. Um, COVID, like all or almost all newly emerging infectious diseases, is what's called a, a zoonosis. Um, and a zoonosis is, is um, basically it's an infectious disease ca caused by viruses, bacteria, or parasites that are spread from a vertebrate animal to humans. Um, all human disease, according to The Lancet, all human diseases to emerge in the last 20 years have had an animal source, okay? Which, which um, when you think about it, is not surprising, right? Because if it's a newly emerging disease, then it's, it, it is hitherto not found in us, so it has to come from somewhere else. And it's uh, animals provide the most, the most likely source. So this is not particularly, um, not particularly controversial. Um, in general, Tropical diseases tend to tend to derive from, from wild animals. Um, temperate diseases tend to derive from domestic animals. They they they, they came about um, when we started farming, and um, they've they've sort of gradually settled down. So they don't tend to be quite as severe as as, as a general rule of thumb. Um, when you have a zoo a zoonotic pathogen, um, then to infect humans. Um, it's going to have to go through five developmental stages. So in stage one, the pathogen uh, exists in animals, but it's not transmitted to humans under normal conditions. Okay, Most, most um, pathogens stay that way. They stay in the animal, their animal host. They don't, they don't make the jump to, uh, to, to other species, and not to humans, certainly not to humans. Um, a stage two pathogen exists in animals and has been transmitted to humans under natural conditions. Um, that's what's known as primary infection. But there's no little or secondary human to human transmission or secondary transmission, secondary infection. Um, 
Example would be, for example, rabies. Okay, it can be transmitted to humans. You get bitten by a rabbit animal. You will contract rabies if without without uh, intervention. But it's not. It's 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 very unusual for rabies to spread between human beings. Um, this is, I mean, largely because of modes of transmission. I think uh, rabbit animals will often bite. Rabbit humans, in fact, don't often bite. <laughs> But whatever the reason, you've got a stage two pathogen when you've got the possibility the possibility of transmission to humans, but um, where there is very little transmission between humans. Um, stage three pathogen. Um, a stage three pathogen is one that is transmissible between humans, right? Um, but the transmission is a very low efficiency. Okay, or relatively low efficiency. So what you tend to find with these pathogens is there'll be an outbreak, it will flare up, but relatively quickly die down. So examples of this would be monkeypox, uh, the very nasty uh, Ebola, um, and the apparently even nastier Marburg virus, which like Ebola is a hemorrhagic uh, pathogen. Um, stage four pathogen is it's actually a very complex developmental stage, but Basically, the idea is uh, it's evolved in such a way that it's now easily transmissible between humans. Influenza or various types of influenza, COVID, and so on. Um, and say a stage five pathogen has evolved to, uh, to be one that's now just exclusive. Measles, mumps, rubella, syphilis, um, and so on. So to jump ship from some creature to us, uh, the pathogen has to bridge these sort of five developmental stages. Um, there are very, various factors which, which will de determine or decide whether this is likely to happen. So uh, abundance of existing hosts. There's a little red cross next to this. I'll, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. So abundance of exit. So if you're an aspirational influenza virus, for example, with with ambitions to jump species, then don't 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 specialize in the Madagascar pochard duck, because it's, it's the rarest bird in the world. Okay, um, pick something a little more common, like um, a mallard, for example. But similarly, if you're a, an ambitious pathogen, if you only manage to uh, to infect a tiny number of hours, then again, you're probably not going to have the opportunity to jump the ship. Um, for, for pathogens, genetic flexibility. In order to move from one species to another, you have to be able to adapt. The, 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 your, your new environment is going to be dissimilar to the old one in various ways. You're going to have to need to adapt, so you're going to have to be flexible, you're going to have to change your structure in certain ways. Um, so, pathogen, the, the, so in general, the more flexible a pathogen is, the more it can, it can evolve, uh, mutate, then the greater the chance it has of um, jumping ship from one species to another. Um, the fourth factor is the phylogenetic distance between um, the old animal host, or the reservoir, as it's sometimes called, and the new host. So if, 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 you're a, if you're a virus, for example, that, that has already adapted to grade apes like chimpanzees or gorillas, then you're going to be high, already highly adapted to a human body, okay? Um, because, because of the similarities, the, the lack of phylogenetic distance between us and them. We're very similar to them biologically. A virus which sets up home in a chimpanzee is already going to be highly adapted, largely adapted, to set up home in humans. Um, if on the other hand, uh, we're talking about say a, a virus which is set up home in an elephant, then it's gonna have more work to do in order to jump to uh, humans. It's never actually happened yet. There's no known, no known pathogen that's jumped from an elephant to a human. Uh, and five, um, the frequency of encounters between the animal host and potential human host. Okay. The more we encounter infected animals, the more likely it is we're, that a, one of their pathogens is going to jump ship to us. Um, uh, but 
unlike the others, um, I put a little green tick next to this. Um, anyone work out why? It's it, it, it's actually it's, it's it's the only thing that we have any real control over. Okay, we can't really control the abundance. I mean, people talk about killing off all the bats. That would be disastrous for a variety of reasons, right? But we can't really control the abundance of existing host or proportion of the animal host infected or the genetic flexibility of a pathogen or even the phylogenetic distance between us and them. What we can control is the actual physical distance, right? Um, stop encountering um, in, encountering infective, anim infective animals. Um, so frequency of encounters, basically, well, what's the number one reason for um, frequency of encounters? Well, it's encroachment on territory, specifically us encroaching on their territory. They don't go wandering into ours, typically, right? Um, so we encroach on their territory. There are a variety of reasons. I mean, for example, Ebola outbreaks often go with moving in off of um, lumber firms, which clear out the forest pay local people to provide bush feed to feed the workers and so on and so on. So that that's that's uh, that's encroachment on territory. But we know from IPBES, whose name I still can't remember, but we know from IPBES that uh, the number one reason for encroachment on, on territory is change in land use. Um, and uh, the number one reason for change in land use is pastoral farming, animal farming in its various forms. And so it seems that animal agriculture is going also to be the most significant driver of newly emerging infectious diseases. Uh, just like it was the most significant driver of um, extinction. Okay, the third case, clim climate, climate change um, is more complicated. Um, and to, to understand this, um, we have to, I think, appreciate the deeply unusual time in which we we live. Um, a human civilization made up of vast, interconnected, incredibly complex societies. Um, if you look at human history, well, that's that's very much the exception. And when we've had something approximating that, then they tend to last a little while, and then they die down. They they disappear. With the various empires world as a scene. Um, this is unusual. This current state of the world is unusual. It's not it's not like a sort of manifest destiny. Um, it has to be maintained. Um, here's a way of thinking about it, which I kind of like. It's, it's, it's not it's not mandatory, but you think of as um, as complex structures, societies like any complex structure will only be maintained if there's a net impact energy. Okay, so the nature of complex structures to become similar structures by through increasing entropy. Um, given the fir first two laws of thermodynamics, the first and second, um, any complex structure needs a continuing net input of, of energy to keep it in existence. And the discipline of ec ecological economics, at least some of its more some of its branches, are built on on the idea that as complex structures, the two laws of thermodynamics applied to them also, just as they apply to biological structures. So societies of complex structures, their continuation requires input of energy. Um, once the quality of the energy supply diminishes below a certain level, then a complex society will break down into uh, simpler ones. Uh, this is all, the, 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 these claims are sort of uh, central to, I think, Joseph, Joseph, Taint, Joseph Tainter's seminal work on, on collapse. And in particular, his, um, his, his 1988 book, the, the, Co the Collapse of Complex uh, Societies. So what does it mean to talk about the quality of, of an energy supply? Um, this is Big Pit in Blan Avon, where some of my ancestors apparently worked. Um, for the quality, so so imagine, right? Imagine that you are um, a coal miner, and um, or you've just discovered a rich seam of coal, and you've got to get it out. Now, if you can get your hands on it, then um, and burn it, then this will release a certain amount of energy, which you can then use for your purposes. Okay. 
Um, but on the other hand, so that's the energy, that, that's the energy. Of but on the other hand, you're going to have to expend a certain amount of energy in getting your hands on it. You're going to have to, uh, you, you, there are going to have to be miners who are paid and housed and sheltered and fed and, and, and so on. The tools will have to be made for them um, to dig the coal out. Some kind of infrastructure will have to be built in order to allow us to um, distribute the coal. There's not going to be much use if it's just stuck at the, the mine mouth. So this is all in the other coal. So the EROI, what's called the EROI of um, an energy source, is the amount of energy you get out of it divided by the amount of the amount of energy you had to put in to get your hands on the source in the first place and use it. Okay. Some people talk in terms of net energy. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, Net energy is the energy you get from a source minus, rather than divided, minus the um, the amount of energy you had to put in to get it. Uh, usually, um, net energy is zero minus one. So it comes out. So I'll, I'll talk in terms of the energy, but it doesn't really doesn't really matter. So what we need um, to maintain a fabulously complex society such as ours are energy sources of a certain quality. Okay. Um, and what that quality is, is a crucial issue. Um, I got to preface this by saying I'm not, a lot more work has to be done on this, right? I can only go with the work that has been done, right? And I, I think um, it's too sparse, a lot more needs to be done. But these are the sort of figures we get from people who know a lot more about this stuff than I do. So, according to a well-known survey by, by David Murphy in 2014, the average EROI required to maintain a society recognizably like our own is roughly 11 to 14 to 1. That is, you need, from any, any energy source, you will need to be able to extract 40, 11 to 14 times as much energy as you had to put in to get it. Um, that focuses on a society that's ours in, in, in sort of like ours in, in material um, terms. Lambert Hall and, and, and colleagues have, have, have looked a bit further into the kind of dynamics of, 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 of societies like ours. And um, they argue, right, that if we're to maintain certain um, well-known and by and large welcomed um, hallmarks of so successful liberal democracies, right? Then we're going to need energy sources with a somewhat higher ERI, 20 to 25, ideally 25. So what sort of things are they thinking of? Well, uh, you know, good scores on the human development, for example. Um, female equality, gen uh, female literacy, gender equality, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, for obvious reasons, I mean, if you... Um, if you if if you insist right on educating both halves of the population, then you're going to need bigger schools, for example, which require energy and so on. So, right. So so for fairly obvious reasons, the Lambert and Hall basically surveyed societies where the EROI was in the sort of 20, 20 to twenty five region, and they discovered that, or they argued that, once. Um, once you dip below this kind of figure, countries which dip below this, this sort of figure in the energy sources available to them, they tend to do very badly um, in these sorts of, um, in terms of these sorts of uh, things, okay? So um, gender equality, female literacy, high scores in the human development index, they don't, they don't, you don't find them in uh, societies, or you find them very rarely in societies with, um, with the EROI of an energy source is below 20 to 25, right? Um, so if we were if, if we were to maintain a society something like this, right? Um, we're gonna need energy sources with this kind of uh, EROI, but they're also, if, if we accept that climate change is a big problem, right? Then um, these energy sources are gonna have to be compatible with climate mitigation. Um, so you look at the um, historical figures, right, for um, uh, two primary fossil fuels, coal and oil. Um, 
historically, the ERIs were always in the region of, of 100 or perhaps even plus. That is, you, you, would get a, you would get 100 times as much energy out of these sources as, as you would have to invest in um, getting them, acquiring them. Uh, today, that has changed um, significantly due to physical problems with extraction, geopolitical problems, and so on. But globally, co coal today is thought to have a, a, an ERI of somewhere in the region of 25 to 29. Um, oil, um, somewhere in the region of 25. Tar sand oil, that's the, the figures there are just not, not very comforting at all due to a very nasty climate and problems of extraction. The ERI of that is thought to be somewhere in the region of two to three. Um, so you see already, if, if, we, if we believe Lambert Hall and colleagues and we need ERIs of 20 to 25, um, then we're already uncomfortably close to that, that threshold. But the problem is, if we continue to use these, these, uh, these, uh, these um, sources, we're going to have to make them climate friendly. And that's where the problems really begin. So how do you make coal climate friendly? You've got a coal... A uh, coal-fired power plant, for example, you want to make it climate friendly. So what you're going to have to use is some kind of carbon capture and sequestration technology, CCS technology, as it's used. The thing about the thing about CCS is that it's going to be energetically very expensive. Okay. So think about it. What you've got to do, well, first of all, you've got to separate the carbon dioxide from, from effluent gases, right? Um which will probably require some new construction nearby, but probably, probably, but that's not the real problem. Secondly, you've got to capture it. Okay. Well, how do you capture a gas? It's diffuse, it's everywhere. You can't capture it in that form. You have to liquefy it. How do you liquefy carbon dioxide? Well, you you have to um, either compress it or cool it or both, which is an energetically very expensive um, practice. Okay. Then you have to transport it. Um, you can't be stuck with all these cylinders, these metal cylinders of um, carbon dioxide in your power plant. So you have to transport it somewhere, which is going to require infrastructure we currently don't have. Where do you where do you transport it to? Well, wherever it is, you're going to sequester it. Um, the problem is we don't we don't know where it is we're going to sequester it. Some suggested the deep ocean, which I think is is is, is not looked on particularly favorably because of the problem of ocean acidification, okay? Um, at present, um, the, only, the only time this has been tried, the sequestering, is, is with um, what are called played out oil fields. A played out oil field is an oil, oil field that's almost used up, but not quite. There's, there's a bit of oil left in there, but you just can't get your hands on it. So what you do, you, you get this carbon dioxide, you pump it into the, the you pump it into the the oil well. The oil is then moved to a certain area where you can then drill and extract it. So the whole the point of all this climate friendly carbon cash and sequestration has been to enable us to get a, in, to enable us to get our hands on more fossil fuels. Now we could get rid of that part, but the problem is we don't really know where else it is we're going to sequester. Uh, and even if we did. The whole process is going to be quite energetically quite costly, which is going to pull down the the e right of fossil fuels even further. So the upshot is, if we want to um, if we want to make fossil fuels climate friendly, we're probably going to have to reduce their e right to below the point of viability. That seems likely, especially as the e right even without carbon capture and sequestration you know, is is going down and down. Um. So, so it's not clear that that, that policy is going to, going to enable us to maintain society's current uh, its current form. So nuclear fission, um, some countries are thrown in there. There a lot with this. It's tricky, and this is where I go back to the, not happy with the amount of work that's done on calculating e rights. So this is all reasoning from a position of, of ignorance to some extent. But the, 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 this is this is what we find when we look at peer reviews, estimates of the, the, the ERI of nuclear fission. 
Um, so Lenson, in a well-known study, said it was five. Lambert Hall and all in what was a sort of a meta-analysis, a study of various studies, um, thought it was somewhere in the region of five to 40, okay? Um, so it doesn't, if, if this is right, it doesn't scream out, well, here's the answer to our, our, our climate problems, right? Uh, not if we want to maintain society recognizably like our own. Uh, the estimates vary. I mean, some estimates you see will say, oh, less than one, right? The era of nuclear fission is less than one, but that comes from a sort of, you know, long time opponent of the nuclear industry. Oh, it's more than it's more than 86, says another, but that comes from the World Nuclear Organization, right? If you look at the peer-reviewed estimates, they generally coalesce in the sort of five to 40 region, though there are outliers. And as I say, this is, this is, um, I think a point of great ignorance on our part. Um, so renewables, that, that's where people, including me, have, have, have placed, have, have placed um, you know, our hopes. Um, the problem is it's really not clear that in their current form, they're going to do the job of maintaining society recognized. Like our own. So biofuels, um, a lot of work, a lot of money has gone into biofuels in the U.S. in recent years. It's almost certainly wasted because their their um, their is just very very they're too low. Um, so temperate latitudes in in the U.S. is all corn, diesel, corn ethanol. Um, then the ERI is one to two. Um, tropical biofuels, sugarcane are better, but three to seven at best. Not really viable. Solar, again, estimates vary because this is a very partisan um, business. Solar estimates are in the region of one to 10. If it's 10, it's on the cusp of viability. If it's one, it's, it's essentially useless. Wind, three to 18. Um, 18 is promising, three, not so much. Um, wave, I, I think, you know, I've seen figures of 15 suggested, but this is, wave technology is so very new, it's it's difficult to place any store in those. Hydro is good, 10 to 84. Um, 84, that would solve all our climate woes, if only the geographical sites were so limited, were not so limited. Um, so to set up a hydropower dam, you need a certain geological configuration. The really good ones, we've, we've kind of, we've, we've more or less used those up. Um, so because of the limited sites available, while it's good, uh, it doesn't seem to be a kind of general solution to um, uh, energy worries. Um, this this is a sort of a graphic way of thinking about it. It's called, the, it became known as the net energy cliff, um, first survived by a guy called Ewan Burns. Okay. So you see the general the general idea. So you look at say historic oil uh, and gas fields. Um, so E rise into very 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 good figures there, twenty nine to, to to fifty, probably a lot higher today. Globally, then we're we're, we're down to about twenty six on average. Um, wind energy. On good projections, sort of in the 17 to 18 range, that would be that would be nice. Um, but um, the nuclear is so the, the, the basic idea. The basic idea is once you, if you can stay away from the edge of the cliff, you're doing okay, right? But once once you get to the edge of the cliff, then you're going to have to start spending a lot more energy in order to acquire energy. And when you get to a certain point, uh, you start falling off the cliff. Now you're you're spending as much energy trying to acquire energy as the energy you acquire by doing so, right? So you're in effect you're kind of running to um, to stay still. Um, and then yeah, well, corn-based ethanol that's just an ugly mess on the canyon floor. You know, no, there's no point even thinking about that. Um, so. This seems this seems to be the, the the general picture. Biofuels, no. Uh, hydro, impressive, but limited application. Solar, well, who's to say? I mean, it's either entirely useless 
or on the cusp of viability. I suspect more like the cusp of viability, but but it's 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 really not clear. Wind, either useless or or, or promising. Um, wave too early to tell. Um, one thing about these technologies that's not true of nuclear. If you look at if you look at sort of technological um, development, and there was a philosopher called Nicholas Rescher who sort of pointed this out. Um, If you look at technological development, they tend to be, when you have a new technology being developed, um, they tend to make huge strides initially. Right? Um, think, think of flight. Right? There was like the Wright brothers on a beach in North Carolina, Kitty Hawk in, in 1903, I think it was, right? And then 66 years later, we were on the moon. Okay, but since then, well, not so much. I mean, impressive little technical achievements, but nothing groundbreaking, like the transition from flying this little rickety thing to building a rocket that'll take you to the moon, you know? Typically, in the course of a, a technological development, the low-flying fruit, low-hanging fruit is, is, um, is, is picked first, and then development becomes a lot more difficult. In addition to Russia, Tainter has talked about this as well. Um, Nuclear technology is basically a 1950s technology that probably peaked in the 1970s. Um, it would not be reasonable, given what we know about technological development, to expect any major innovations that would push up the ERI that much further. With renewables, the technology is younger. We can be a little more hopeful. How much more hopeful, I don't know, but a little more hopeful than we are with, uh, I think, nuclear. Um, Okay, so I think the overall picture which emerges, and I stress the level of ignorance involved here because there hasn't been enough work done on calculating ERIs of various sources, uh, just going with what we have. I think the overall picture right, is, is of um, our energy sources being on the cusp of variability, certainly with renewables, right? The cusp of viability, they might work, they might not. Um, is there anything we can do, you might think, to um, to sort of help? Um, we, so we're stuck between okay, you know, the proverbial rock and a hard place. We need we need energy sources with uh, ERIs above a certain level, um, but we also need energy sources that are climate friendly. So you've got climate friendly ERIs in the eleven to twenty five range, right? And it's not clear uh, that any energy source available to us can meet both one and two. Condition one and two, the climate friendly, the high enough theory. Right? So what do we do? Well, what we do is remember that um, energy input um, comes in two forms. Energy input to our society comes in two forms, um, fuel, but also food. And when ecological economists write about e rise they'll talk about um, uh, mine mass e rise the e rise of coal that exits the mine, the wellhead e rise the, the e rise of oil as it gushes out of the ground. But they also talk about farm gate evil. Okay. And I think a focus on on, on animals is useless. Uh, it's, it's useful. Hope it's not useless. <laughs> Let's hope. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Anyway. Let's, let's see what we can do with it. Um, so meat is one to, between one to four and one to 54. I think 54 is probably a bit, a bit harsh. 1 to 25 to 26, maybe, for some certain meats. Um, think about, you, you see the difference between these. I mean, okay, the, the eras of coal and oil and so on declining, but at least um, they're, they're top heavy. At least, at least the numerator is greater than the, the denominator, okay? When you, when you switch to animals, it's the other way around. The, the eras are inverted. So... Um, to say that meat has an ERI of uh, 1 to 4 or 1 to 25 or something like that um, is to say that you will have to put in, you will have to invest four times as much energy in producing a certain amount of meat as you would get out of eating it. Okay, So the ERIs are upside down. Um, so this... So... It may be, given, given, given the problems we have with other energy sources, um, a kind of simplification has to be made to the energy supply chain which keeps our society existent. 
The suggestion is that um, this energy simplification involves cutting out these things with overturned upside down eroids. It was a luxury we, we could afford once, but it's not clear that it's, it's, it's something we can afford anymore. So this, 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 this energy charge that we've made, um, according to the UN, this is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, it's responsible for 14 and a half of climate, 14 and a half percent of climate emissions, um, more than the entire transport sector combined, apparently. This, this amounts to um, 7.1 gigatons of CO2, which is roughly one fifth, maybe slightly less than one fifth of the total amount of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions humans emit in total. So about yeah, roughly one fifth, slightly less maybe of all um, emissions. Um, the carbon dioxide thing is uh, it's, it's tricky because different different gases. There's a, what's known as carbon dioxide equivalent. That, that's how emissions are calculated. So the idea is if you, if you have, say, a ton of um, carbon dioxide, um, sorry, ca carbon dioxide has a global warming potential of one by definition, right? Methane um, has a global warming potential of at least 25, some say 80 something, but at least 25, right? So that is, the idea is if you put a ton of methane into the atmosphere, that is as if you put 25 tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, nitrous oxide, global warming potential of 300. So if you put a ton of that in the atmosphere, it's like you put 300 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and, and people say there was a recent book which took this line, oh, um, carbon, uh, animal agriculture is only responsible for 5% of global warming. Uh, but what they meant was it's responsible for 5% of carbon dioxide emissions, ignoring the methane, which um, animal farming results in 44% of all anthropogenic, that is human caused um, methane emissions. It's responsible for 53% of uh, anthropogenic um, minus oxide emissions. So if you look at say various um, Emissions intensities. Again, the, 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 these graphs are from the United Nations. So if you wanted, this is kilograms of green greenhouse gas per kilogram of food. So if you wanted to produce a kilogram of beef, right, then you would have to put into the atmosphere 70.6 kilograms of um, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. With lamb, a kilogram of lamb will cost you 39.7 kilograms of uh, climate emissions per kilogram of uh, Per, per kilogram of land. And you see the general sort of pattern here, animals are over this side, plants over this side, okay? Milk is the best for animals, but by and large, once you get to these low sorts of numbers, then it's, we're, we're, we're dealing with, not with animals, we're dealing with plants and other things. Okay, or, or you could look at some um, kilograms of greenhouse emissions per 100 grams of protein. Right, so if you wanted to produce 100 grams of protein, um, then this would require 35 and a half kilograms of, of carbon dioxide equivalent gases. And again, the, um, the the animals are all over this side, the big side. Once you get to the other side, we're dealing with um, plant-based food. Um, so. We could put the same things in terms of um, calories, in terms of energy. If you want, if you want to produce a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand kilocalories kilocalor of shellfish or beef, then you're talking twenty-five to twenty-six kilograms of greenhouse gas, and so on. So, the net result of all these sorts of intensity calculations right, is that um, whenever you want to grow meat. Um, whenever you want to produce meat, you're going to need a lot more land right, than, uh, than if you were um, just growing plants. So with beef, to, 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 um, to get a, um, I'm sorry, what did I just do there? Sorry, apologies for that. Um, how do I get it back? The little square, thank you, great. So 
if you wanted to produce a thousand kilocalories of um, of beef energy, energy from beef, then you would need 120 square meters of land, right? Lamb and mutton slightly less. Uh, once again, the animals are all up this this end of the the graph. Uh, all the sprouting things, all the things that are not animals, are down this half. So you need vastly less land okay, to produce the same amount of uh, kilocalories per um, per, per any given animal, right? So if we were to if we were to give up eating meat, then basically we would need a fraction. And you look at the sort of differences, right? The, the difference between four. 0.2 square meters for tomatoes and uh, 120 square meters for beef, right? And this is per thousand kilocalories, right? If you look at these figures, it's pretty clear we're going to need a tiny fraction of the amount of land, um, the tiny fraction amount of land we currently use for for, um, for raising animals. The result of this is that we will have lots and lots of acres to do something which is probably still reservations and some people notwithstanding, the most effective thing we can do um, in combating climate change, which is to um, plant trees in an intelligent manner, not just slapping trees everywhere we can. That's not going to work for a variety of reasons, but growing them um, in a, an intelligent way, which I'll talk about in q and I want to try and wrap this up. So according to the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, um, an acre of trees will sequester, draw down, between 2.2 and 9.5 metric tons of carbon dioxide per acre per year, right? Um, the USDA has a similar figure, 2.7 to 7.7, right? So suppose we take a mid-range figure of 5.5, right? The reason I pick 5.5 is that the World Bank estimates that the average, sorry, the carbon footprint of the average American is 16.5 metric tons per year, right? Um, if an acre of trees uh, sequesters 5.5, then it seems we need three acres, um, three acres of forest for each person. If I could only, if I, if I could acquire three acres of forest and just grow trees on there, um, land and grow trees there, then I would essentially erase my my carbon footprint. Um, so, with the population of the United States. 330 million, we need 990 million acres of afforestation. Afforestation is growing trees where trees haven't been grown in the recent past. Um, roughly, and this is, this, is, this is a misleading figure in some ways. Roughly, if, if we gave up raising animals, then we would probably have some in the region of 850 million acres made available in the US, right? which is not 990, but it's a huge portion of it. It's not, it's not, there are problems because not all of the land grazing animals, for example, is suitable for trees. Um, the Great Plains are good examples, it's just too, too arid. But um, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of uh, possibilities to, to be explored. Um, on the other hand, um, Shakamo, would you like me to wrap up five minutes? Okay, I'm doing five. No, I, I'll, I'll do the five, don't worry. <laughs> um, so the flip side, right? The flip side is, is well, loss of sequestering ability when we chop down trees. So according to the World Bank, between 1990 and 2016, the world lost 502,000 square miles of forest. Um, the University of Maryland did a satellite study, which uh, came up with a somewhat higher estimate of 888,000 square miles. Um, so the, just take the World Bank figure, the lower figure, that's... 502,000 square miles is 321 million acres. Um, if you assume one acre sequesters four metric tons a year, which I'll assume because this, I'm not taking into account soil, um, then we're talking um, of 1.28 billion metric tons. Right? That's a, so every year these forests are not there. Every year since they were cut down, Right, um, we have lost the ability to sequester 1.2 billion metric tons of carbon every year. Um, the other, the other part of the flip side, of course, is that um, chopping down trees releases the carbon they contain. Um, and according to the World Resources Institute, they came with this famous 
claim. Um, deforestation were a country, it would rank third in carbon dioxide equivalent emissions only behind China and the United States of America. Um, so roughly 4.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions per year are re result from um, basically deforestation. Um, so if you count the 1.2 gigatons of loss sequestering ability every year, plus the 4.8 gigatons of emissions from this loss of forest. Then we're talking about six gigatons. Um, and this is just from the amount of forest we're basically losing every year. Um, so the potential for afforestation was, was recently uh, highlighted in, in, in a controversial study by Jean-Francois Bastin and colleagues. Uh, called the the global tree restoration potential. Um, basically, again, this was a satellite study. They estimate there are two point two billion acres available for the forests. So it was a controversial in the sense they were a bit slap shot. They 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 forget they fail to notice, for example, that Kinshasa was there and just oh we can reforest that a forest that. But um, what they didn't take into account, right, which makes this I think a grossly uh, a gross underestimate of the potential is they didn't take into consideration land that's currently used for farming, right? Um, so they, they excluded basically existing agricultural land. Um, if we had, but even if we had the, the, this, what well, I think is conservative 2.2 billion acres, then this, if we include the soil and so on, would, would sequester somewhere in the region of 11 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, right? Which is, is, is not, it used to be one third, it's more like a quarter now, but still a significant amount of anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions um, every, every year. Um, the value of this is that it allows us to give um, the technologies we're developing um, an edge, okay? Just give them a bit of, breathing space, if you like, to hopefully develop into um, the technologies we need them to be. Um, so to summarize, uh, animal agriculture is, is, is the most important driver of mass extinction and newly emerging infectious diseases. And given where we are in our sort of historical development, the societies we, um, we, we inhabit, then these current circumstances um, abandoning animal agriculture is, is the most effective thing we can probably do at the moment to mitigate climate change. Um, I started with Mike Wheeler, so I'm going to finish with Mike Wheeler. So he, he had the misfortune of, of hearing me talk about this before. Right? And he, after, I mean, Mike has many hats, right? But one of them is a world famous Heidegger scholar. Right? And, uh, and so I think, you know, animated by that, say, so, well, this, you know, this is a technological solution. The problem is technological thinking itself. We need to get, this is a sort of Heideggerian theme. All I say to Mike is that we ended up in the same place. Heidegger has his black forest, right? And I'm just advocating for uh, extending this. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much.